Hi, everybody. Um, you're listening and watching a podcast called How Do You Think? I'm so privileged to have Dr. Henry Thomas Marsh today with me, who's an English neurosurgeon and a pioneer of neurosurgical advances in Ukraine and the author of two best-selling books, one I read. I've read Do Not Harm, Stories of Life, Death, and Brain Surgery. And the other book is Admissions, A Life in Brain Surgery. Mr. Marsh, you're planning on having a third book soon, is that correct? That's right, yes. Yeah. And it's called And Finally, which again is a, is a joke because it's it's both and finally because I have advanced cancer with an uncertain prognosis, but also because usually in the English television news, at the end of all the news about disasters and death and everything, they usually then have a sort of light-hearted joke item and they say, and finally. So so the title, once again, is an English, an English joke. Dr. Marsh, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm thrilled that we have this opportunity. I'm going to take about one hour of your time. Okay. And we're going to speak about Ukraine. You're a good yeah. friend of Ukraine, and you've been a friend of Ukraine for more than 30 years. It started right. in 1992. Also, a friend of both of us, Andrew Mizek, he helped arrange this interview as well. And he told me that you are an amazing human being who does a lot for Ukrainians. And mm. I'm happy that we can talk. Um, I've been reading what you've been covering um, since the war has started, and um, I want to dive deeper a bit into that. I'm going to start with a question. How did you wake up to the news that the war started, that the invasion started? How was it for you? I, Andrei Mizak sent me a text message saying, it's war. We've been talking every day on the telephone about will he, won't he, as everybody, all the world was. I felt... Uh, a great sense of dread. I remember I was downstairs in my kitchen in my home in London, and I, I felt this was something truly terrible had happened, not just for Ukraine, but for the whole world, for the free world. Yeah. And when this first feelings, and you, you comprehended it, you accommodated those somehow, what were your first actions? I... I well, it was really, I felt so helpless, you know. <laughs> um, but within the next few days, a very famous English war surgeon called David Knott, who's carried out battlefield surgery in every war zone in the world and has a quite unique experience, he, he reached out to me because he knew of my many connections with Ukraine. And, of course, neurosurgery actually is a very small part of battlefield surgery. So I didn't really have much to contribute medically, but I could help him with contacts. And together, we put out a webinar, it was mainly David's work, not mine, um, about the particular problems you see in, in battlefield surgery. And he actually went out to Ukraine, I think in May, he went to Zhytomyr and Zaporizhzhia, mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and met colleagues. And, but he agreed, actually, but the Ukrainian medical system was pretty well set up um, for dealing with, with war, war surgery, obviously lacking equipment, dressings, drugs, things like that. But on the whole, he was favorably impressed by, by the surgeons he met. Understood, understood. <clears throat> um, since the war broke out, the full invasion, we Ukrainians are... Um, shocked in a good way how the United Kingdom and the citizens of the United Kingdom are helping and welcoming Ukraine. I, um, I had a call with a good friend just a few days ago and she would say, please come to United Kingdom. People are so welcoming. I've been bringing people here because it's so comfortable in a way. I was wondering, how can you explain this? What makes the UK as the country and UK citizens so welcoming? Well, um, firstly, well, England has a long tradition of international philanthropy, particularly for underdogs. <laughs> and the Ukrainians are, have been underdogs for hundreds of years. Um, so it's a strong tradition. I mean, there are 50, 66 million British people and about 100,000 volunteered to take Ukrainian refugees. I have a family now living with me in London. Um, so it's part of the English culture, I think. Now, how long it will last at the same time, you know, we have all these problems of people coming across the channel and with 
sent trying to send illegal asylum seekers to Rwanda. So it's a mixed, it's a complicated picture. But I think everybody, well, everybody, many people understood that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was, was quite different from Syria, from Yemen, although they're terrible as well. But Ukraine was, is a free democratic country. And the invasion by Russia was just, you know, wrong. Much when you get a very straightforward moral judgment. This was wrong, it was bullying, it was exactly the same as Hitler and the Nazis. And we all know that Putin's Russia is essentially a, a neo-fascist state. I must tell you that um, I've been speaking to various Europeans in the last uh, few months, uh, uh, specifically saying Austrians, German, Germans, and what I've heard is um, that they had the reluctance, a lot of reluctance, um, by accepting Syrian refugees, let's say, and they, there's way less reluctance in accepting Ukrainians. And when I when I speak about Austria per se, um, what I found that people are feeling guilty, so they're accepting. And, and therefore they're accepting Ukrainians, guilty um, in two dimensions. One, they were not that welcome into Syrians who they felt are more of a uh, not us, because yes. they're not, I'm sorry for this, they're not right. white, yes. they're not educated. Yeah, yeah, they're not, and they're Muslims, they're not, not And they're Muslims, Muslims exactly. Muslim yeah. And number two, so that's argument number one. And argument number two is because Austrians feel guilty after the Second World War, as yeah. um, th a third of the country were active Nazis. And yeah, this yeah. is a very interesting thing, and I wanted to discuss that with you. Like, what's your thinking about it? Well, as you know, my, my mother was German. She was a political refugee from Hitler's Germany. She had to, she got into trouble with the Gestapo, the secret police, and had to flee, flee to England. So these questions and problems have always been very close to my heart. Um, I think it is very complicated with Russia and uh, with Germany and Austria. They, they have a a deep sense of guilt, but at the same time, they are, they're relatively pacifist countries as well. So it puts them in a very difficult, in a very difficult position. Um, and at the same time, of course, because of the policy of appeasement, which certainly Angela Merkel followed. I mean, there was a book, there's an English journalist and politician called Edward Lucas, who wrote a book like almost 20 years ago, called The New Cold War, which was recommended to me by a Ukrainian friend of mine called Alexis Olhubenko, who was uh, head of the Ukrainian desk for the BBC World Service. He's, he's dead now, alas, but he was a very good man and a very good friend. And he told me about this book 20 years ago, and I read it. And it was all about the way Putin was weaponizing gas supplies to Europe. And Germany just walked into it, you know, and that's Gerhard Schroeder um, on the board of Rosneft and all that. So, you know, the Germans took this view, well, if we trade with Russia, it's bound to work out more or less okay. And they were completely wrong. But they still have, these, you know, Europe is still paying, what is that, I don't know, 40 billion euros a month or a week or something. It's, they're still funding Russia. Uh, and the sanctions are not going to have any immediate effect. They may have some long-term effect. So Germany is in a very conflicted position. But at the same time, because they have a terrible history of, of the Nazi regime and what they did to Eastern Europe, it is very difficult for them. In England, it's our views are rather, rather easier and more straightforward, I think. But how much longer that sympathy for Ukrainian refugees will go on, I don't, I don't know. But as you say, we say in English, charity begins at home. It's easier to feel charitable to your neighbor than it is to somebody further away. And although I quite understand the very angry threads on Twitter about, you know, why, why aren't you helping the Palestinians? Why aren't you helping Yemen and Syria and all that? That it's terrible, I agree, but Ukraine is very close, it's close to home. And when I first went there 30 years ago, I recognized it immediately as a European country, a European country struggling to escape its, the Russian Soviet tradition and oppression. And although 
superficially, my work was medical, it was neurosurgical. I always felt really it was more in the sense it was political. And the, what is unusual about me, dare I say it, is I took my first degree was in politics and economics at Oxford University, and I studied Soviet and Eastern European politics and did a special paper in that under Professor Archie Brown, who was a professor at, at St. Anthony's College, known as the Spies College, where all the British spies were recruited. So I also had this deep and profound interest in Russian, Ukrainian, Eastern European politics and culture. And when purely by chance, I had the chance to go to Kiev in um, 1992, I just felt here was work to be done. Yes, clinical work, helping my colleagues do things better, but also trying to introduce some honesty and transparency and rationality and discussion in the medical practice. Because at Did that you time, sorry, Did, I'm sorry. Did you succeed with this? Ah, yes and no is the answer. You'd have to ask my Ukrainian colleagues. The guy I worked with for 20 years, I eventually stopped working with. Because as he became more and more successful, he became more and more like the very dictatorial Soviet professors. I thought I was helping him escape. Um, and it shows how complicated it is. I mean, again, one of the big problems Ukraine faces, if, God willing, the, the war goes well, whatever that means, because whatever happens, Ukraine suffered terribly, is, you know, how you'll deal with reconstructing Ukraine when corruption is still such a big problem. I mean, hopefully the war will somehow have cauterized the corruption out, but I, I fear not. Uh, and the Western powers, if they're going to invest money in reconstructing Ukraine, as opposed to just guns and bombs, will want evidence that the money won't all get you know, taken away corruptly. And that's going to be a problem, but that's in the future. But it's still, also, Ukraine remains a very complicated country with many problems. That is true. Of course, as a Ukrainian, I, I admit that. By the way, you've been saying for quite a long time, and I quote, Ukraine is in fact a very important country, yes. the border between Western freedom and yep. Russian slavery. Exactly. They just, uh, and you said that you've been saying that for 30 years. 30 years. And so I knew it. I knew it immediately, partly because I'd spent so much time reading and studying European and Russian history. Um, but it was immediately apparent to me that this was a hugely important historical watershed, a meeting of different different cultures. And of course, you had it. I never thought, I, mean, I remember I'd tell people, who English people knew nothing about Ukraine, and I explained that Western Ukraine was never part of Russia, it was part of Poland and Austro-Hungary and all that. Um, but I'd say, yes, you know, in the East, Eastern Ukraine is more Russophile and Russian is first language. But I said, there's never going to be a war like in Yugoslavia. You know, how wrong I was. But it was an invasion. It wasn't in that sense. It's not a civil war. It's a straightforward invasion, as was. I mean, Crimea is more complicated, I think. But, but Luhansk and Donbass, and that was an invasion. And now we certainly are seeing a straightforward invasion. Understood. Understood. By the way, I must uh, I, I must tell you that um, as a Ukrainian, I've been, of course, I've been learning history of Ukraine a lot, and uh, we like dwelling on the part where the history of Ukraine starts from um, fifth century when Kiev yeah. was Kiev was there. So yeah. we believe that um, we've been a part of ourselves for a very very long time, and then it it happened so that we were fighting for the freedom. Like by the way, like Poles did with various countries nearby. But that's. But that's history. Yeah, let's move. It's very complicated because Ukraine is flat, and yeah. people have been fighting there for hundreds of years. And with that, with that quote that I quotation that I that I just mentioned, you were telling that to Europeans and to the um, Englishmen and people of the world for thirty years, and you said that they were blinking and saying, "No, no, 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 no Ukraine is not that." But well, the thirty years know, they, they didn't even know where Ukraine was. Scarcely, you know. well, isn't it? And thirty years Russia? passed. <laughs> <laughs> that that's what that's what we are accustomed in a way. Exactly. Then time has changed, and oh yeah, how yeah how how have changed the views of the people that were um, saying that Ukraine is part of Russia? To like well, now. I mean, I, I I can only speak for people I know, but it yes. really started to change in Maidan 
and the extraordinary images um, of the fighting in Maidan eight years ago. I was at Maidan on several days, uh, not on the day the killing happened, but I was very immensely proud to have to have been there. Um, no, I think people, it is clearly understood that Ukraine is a free, independent country which has been invaded by a fascist, ruthless, brutal neighbor, namely Russia. And the history of Russian brutality goes back hundreds of years. I mean, Putin is one of a long line, Lenin, mm. Stalin, Lenin, the Tsars, Ivan Grozny, Genghis Khan, you know, his, his direct apostolic descent from these bastards. Coming back further to this, and knowing so much about history of Russia and history of Ukraine, how does it either help you or help you to comprehend what is happening right now, what's been happening in the last hundred plus days? Like knowing what you know, how does it help you to understand the war now? It helps me understand that the Ukrainians, many, many Ukrainians would rather die than be subjected to Russian rule. I mean, to a certain extent, but the, the resistance will be intense. And Ukraine is fighting for its very freedom and life under Russia would be terrible. So I think the war will go on in one way or another. Um, obviously, the Western allies have been rather slow to provide the necessary weapons to counter Russian artillery. But I don't see, I don't see any, I don't see the war ending soon. And, and what form say, it will take, I don't know. And when you're saying that Europeans and allies are quite, quite rather slow than fast, mm. and you've been writing about this, why do you think this is happening so slow? What makes it being slow? Because, first of all, I think nobody expected to Ukraine to put up the fight they did. You know, everybody mm. assumed Kiev would fall within a few days. And people know all the West, so many Western experts did not realize how the sort of degeneracy and corruption of the Russian state applied to the army as well. That clearly the, the army was corrupt and chaotic and poorly equipped. And they're now succeeding, for want of a better word, simply by more bombs and more shells. Um, so uh, I've lost track of what I was going to say there, but um, sorry, carry on. Yeah, it's OK. We will carry on. So the, I was mostly wondering, um, you, you as the citizen of the UK, you're reading yes. a lot of uh, a lot of various media and you're mm. highly informed. And mm. we're discussing what takes it so long for the European. Oh, yeah. Well, I was saying, well, that's it. Firstly, nobody expected Ukraine to be still in the war after three months. Secondly, fear of Russia. I, don't, I think Putin and his crew are completely rational. I don't think they want to use nuclear weapons for a moment. But they, there is people on the Russian media who are enjoying themselves, you know, talking about nuclear war to, to frighten the Germans and the Austrians. It was us bullying. You know, they, they know if, the, a, if a nuclear exchange started, it could go horribly out of control. And they, they won't do that. I, I don't think they'll do that for a moment. And this all fear of Putin, what will Putin do when he's cornered? Well, I, I, I think he's rational. I, I think he's totally deluded. His view of Russian history is not mad. It's just Russian. You know, there, there's been this messianic tradition in Russian culture for a long time. If you've read Gogol's Dead Souls, at the end of it, where it describes Russia as a troika going off into the future. And, you know, Moscow is the third Rome. And again, Putin is, is a long intellectual tradition. And it is, of course, uh, speaking psychologically, because of a deep Russian inferiority complex, <laughs> which dates back to Peter the Great. They're, they're struggling to be keep up with Europe and the West, and part of them knows they, they, they're not quite succeeding, and so they, come, they compensate with this ludicrous, Slavic, mystical, messianic view of Russia, which is, you know, and Putin's working in that, in that tradition. He's not mad at all. By the way, um, 
talking about the Russian uh, state media hosts that were bragging about nuclear yeah. uh, submarine attacking the UK. By the way, I, yeah. I think you've seen this video or something. Yes. Do you think that that what that was mainly made just to create a fear or agony? Um, yes. Um, yeah. It was just in, just uh, just bullying, bullying. Yeah. And that bullying, how does it work in the UK? So the, the people of the UK have does. seen that. I, I don't. I don't think it does work on the whole. Um, I mean, it hasn't. I mean, Boris Johnson, our our prime minister, is supporting Ukraine for his own his own political reasons, but he's doing the right thing, even if for the for the wrong reasons. Um, and I, I think you know the the reality of mad, mutually assured destruction um, with nuclear warfare still applies. And I know the Russians have tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. But if they start using them, and they wouldn't necessarily, from what I've read, be very effective, it, you could easily, it could easily destabilize and turn into a full-blown nuclear war. And even the Russians don't want that. They always talk about, well, the world isn't worth living in if Russia doesn't exist. I mean, that's crap. It's just nonsense. And when you're watching and reading the news, by the way, the first question is, um, yeah. What's what's your news agenda? What's your information agenda? What's your well, diet? I, I, a lot of it's on Twitter actually. I joined I joined Twitter um, because of the war, and I now tweet occasionally. I look at the BBC news um, website, which is pretty good, but it's always about twenty four hours behind Twitter. But the problem with Twitter is you have to choose your choose the people you want to follow. Um, but but I don't I don't speak or read Russian or Ukrainian alas, but there are quite a lot of good Ukrainian um, threads in English which I follow every day. So I get up first thing in the morning. I get out my mobile and read the latest news. At the moment it's depressing, but I was talking to Andrew Mizak this morning and said, well, you know, the war has only just begun. It's not that, even if if as it is is the case that Putin gets Donbass and Luhansk gets. The war will continue. And I know that Schultz and Macron and Draghi going to Kiev will no doubt try to persuade persuade Zelensky to do a deal with Putin. My my understanding of that is if they did that, Zelensky would be kicked out by the Ukrainian public. I might be wrong. But I think the sheer, you know, bloody mindedness of Ukrainians as a sort of peasant underdog people. Is is a very real phenomenon. Um, so I think it's very hard to know what what will happen. Other than that, Ukrainians will go on fighting. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull back for a second for the media question, and then I'm gonna go on with the Ukrainian DNA. So um, the way how you are reading the news, um, you could see whether this is a um, proper, insightful, dignified coverage, or rather more of a clickbait coverage. Yeah, I yeah. was wondering. Yeah. I spoke to I spoke to um, um, English SAS veteran a few days ago, and he says mm. that um, even the UK media and the US and the European media they are not covering um, the war affairs correctly, mostly on the click like with a clickbait yeah. idea. And yeah. yeah, do you agree with this? Well, I'm not in the position to know, but I've learned to always read everything with a certain degree of of skepticism. Um, so. The, the, the honest answer is I, I don't know, um, but one can see the general outlines of what what is going on, and obviously the Ukrainian government is being fairly um, economical with the truth about their own losses. I, I was telling Andrew Mizak during the Second World War, um, near where I used to live in South London, a bomb fell directly down a ventilator shaft into a metro station where 500 people were sheltering and all were killed. And the government didn't refuse to let anybody know about that, you know, for, for, for fear of damaging morale. So I know I don't believe everything the Ukrainian government is saying. And obviously, they're constantly trying to manipulate the Western powers to, to give them more help. At the same time, it's not really in the interests of the Western governments to advertise and tell the Russians exactly what they're doing and what's happening. 
So as, as civilian outsiders, we are always going to be somewhat in the dark. Trying so to what guess. Is, what is happening at the moment in, in, in Donbass is what many people predicted, which is sheer superiority of Russian firepower. Um, you know, if you just demolish, and given they have no compunctions about destroying Mariupol, now they've destroyed Sierra Donetsk, I mean, how can you fight against that without long-range artillery, without air supremacy? You, you can't. And the second part of this question, you mentioned the, in a way, the Ukrainian DNA. Yes. And I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, what have you learned about Ukrainians in this hundred plus days of, of full scale invasion? What have you learned? Nothing new. I mean, I, I don't want to get romanticized and exaggerate Ukrainians. They're, they're, I mean, having worked after a fashion for 30 years in the country, Ukrainians can be very difficult people. And they're not terribly good on calm, rash reasoning and logic a lot of the time. Um, but they're, they're, the English word is bloody-minded. They're tough, independent. Um, and, and they're fighting for, their, for the very existence of the free Ukrainian state, which is why so many people have volunteered to fight. So I don't think I've learned anything new. Um, I guess... What did pleasantly surprise me was how well organized they appeared to be. And I was, obviously, my friends in Ukraine all were very skeptical about Zelensky, um, though he's a TV comedian. But it's been a pretty polished media act. And when he was giving talks to each of the various countries, his speech, you know, in a, it was very well measured to each of the, each of the parliaments he spoke to. So I, I was very impressed by that. I, that was better than I expected, how slick, you know, how slick the media work was. Understood, understood. And if we compare the DNA of the, um, of the Ukrainians and of the British people, what's in common and what's really on separate? These are big, these are big generalizations, aren't they? I understand. Um, well, I think, you know, Fierce, fiercely independent, although we're, England is a very law-abiding country, we do greatly value our freedom and independence, and that, I think, is something we have in common with Ukrainians. Um, and that's as much as I can say. It was such a big, big statement. Um, the, uh, the former SAS veteran, Robin Horsfall, that yes. I spoke to, he said that we British are so, help so helpful towards Ukraine and actually in all of Ukraine because we hate bullies. We as British, yes, I think DNA, I, we, we, like, we, we support underdogs, we hate bullies, yes. And that, that I think is a good, that, that's a good point. Yes, I, I fully said that. Yeah, it's what I said no, earlier. I, yeah, you, you, said it, you yeah. said it earlier. Um, I want to move on to something else. So since the war broke out, the full, the full scale war, um, You've been starting to act in a way. You've, you've, you've hosted a fa Ukrainian family. You, you've held a seminar. You, yeah. You've probably done something else. And I was wondering, um, through the day, what's your routine um, towards Ukraine, towards help of Ukraine? Or well, yesterday I felt very, very depressed all day because I felt the war was going badly. <laughs> so I, I mean, what's been happening? That is just grotesque. I'm a number of people killed. And the number of children, but the, the psychological trauma for not thousands, but millions of children. These are this, and the fact all education has more or less come to a stop. You know, this is, let alone all the deaths and the sheer brutality of the Russian soldiers. So, uh, in a funny sort of way, I find it quite difficult. I feel guilty about being at all happy. If I feel happy about anything, I feel I can't. I mean, bear witness helplessly. To so much horror, uh, I find that I find that very difficult. And I'm going to some meeting next week where lots of I'm hoping to be sitting next to the Ukrainian ambassador, and I'm hoping to talk to various politicians about Ukraine. I just want people. I, I did a tweet recently saying, "Don't forget Ukraine. Please don't forget Ukraine. You know, the war is not going away. The problem is still there." 
And there's only one satisfactory outcome, which is you know, some form of defeat for Putin. And that's a long way away. And I'm going to say, please don't forget about Ukraine. What, what could or should happen so Ukraine is not forgotten? Let's say um, more Buchas or Irpin tragedies, massacres. That always well, creates a, a, a buzz for the media. Well, or some it, other things. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, I think that there have been so many horrors already. There's, there'll be no novelty to further horrors. Um, and the fact Rus the Russians have abducted so many children into to Russia. I mean, it's, it's monstrous. It's terrible what's happening. But I don't think really it can get much worse. Other, other there's more of it. Um, no, I just, it's just important that Western journalists go on reporting on the war as much as they can. Um, and of course, it depends what other stories there are which displace it from the headlines. And uh, I want to mention the foreign journalists that have been actually dying in Ukraine and in and the I front know. line. Yeah, yeah. And, um, Unfortunately, this also creates detraction. So this gets even more coverage yes, because yeah. of the deaths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or recently, the fact some British British soldiers have been killed. You no know, former British army who went out to fight there. That gets a lot of publicity, even though it's just two or three people, as opposed to hundreds of Ukrainians being killed, thousands. By the way, I wanted to get there as well. We have a few international battalions, and we have yeah. uh, soldiers mm -hmm. from around the world. Yeah, um, I know for sure, and you know, I, it's not only Belarus and Georgia, but it's the UK, the US, it's yes. Canada, it's yeah. Denmark, it's Czech Republic, mm. it's uh, Greece. And I was wondering, how do you think, what makes people of other countries to join the war? Well, it's like it's like the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, and it's this sense of moral outrage that one country, a, dicta dict a dictatorship, should invoid, invade a democracy. Um, I mean, if I if I was younger, if I didn't have a family, I would want to go there. I'd want to do something, even though I was a neurosurgeon, I can't do anything useful. Um, no, it is this deep sense of outrage. Um, my father, there was a famous film called To Die in Madrid. My father was a very eminent human rights lawyer. And he told me once, he saw his movie, to die in Madrid, maybe in 1937, 36. And he almost signed up on the spot to join the international brigades fighting Franco. So and then I saw some articles um, about English civilians who've been going to work in Ukraine. I think that's, that's, that's wonderful, you know, and I, I, um, I think that's very brave and very heroic, and I'm proud I of I do think so. And I'm really proud of you and, 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 and thankful yeah. the yeah. British people that are helping. And, but the vice versa here, what are the effects, what are the actual effects and, um, on the British economy, on the regular life of regular person, well, on okay. your life with this war? Well, for my life, none, um, other than psychological anxiety all the time about the war. Um, it's complicated because there's a huge spike in world commodity prices made worse by the Russian oil situation, the Ukrainian grain situation, and the, and the pandemic, and the particular problem in England, the lunacy, the suicidal lunacy of Brexit, which is undoubtedly causing major economic problems. So there are lots and lots, there are lots of big political problems developing in England, Britain at the moment, because of the cost of living, which is happening all over the world, and then, of course, many people are worried that there'll be serious famine in Africa and the Middle East because of the because of Putin's behavior. And that all suits Putin, of course. Putin's delighted. You know, the worse he makes it for everybody, the better for him. You know, and that's unfortunately. Uh, and what it is hard to underestimate the sheer, I think the word evil, the sheer evil of the man. And. Evil and good, this is also one of the topics. Do you think that this is a battle between evil and the good in a metaphorical way? Yes. I mean, they're always, it's always complicated, but in broad terms, yes. It's, this is a straightforward invasion of a democracy by a, by a fascist dictatorial state. And that's evil versus good. 
coming back one step one step back to how how the war affects the British economy and regular mm. British people. I've read a lot that on on Twitter that the Britons are saying, listen, we have to sustain the increase of 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 of, of prices for gas, for food, and everything yeah. because Ukrainians are paying with their blood. And we have yeah. to pay with our check. Mm. Do you agree with this? Uh, I don't think many people will buy that for long. Is the answer uh, at the end of the day? Um, People will be more concerned about the. Many people will be more concerned about the cost. Of, I'm I'm lucky. I've, I've I've retired. I have a pension. I have my royalties as a writer. So economically, I'm, I I don't have any worries. But I think for many people, you know, the price of petrol has almost doubled in the last year and a half. Um, it's going to get very hard for many people. So, but whether they're there for an organised pressure to say. Ukraine must reach a peace deal with Russia or not, I don't know. And even if Zelensky is somehow forced into a deal with Putin, the sanctions aren't going to go away. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, I, I, yeah, I don't think the increasing cost of living in England will have a major impact on British military help to Ukraine. Understood, understood. You once I, mentioned, in in May, that we have we as people who are observing the war and, and participate in it, whether with with firearm or psychologically on on any side, we're saying we have a moral obligation to remain optimistic. If we lose yeah. hope, we lose, and then mm. evil will surely triumph. Exactly. Are you still? Are you still? Oh, it's, it's, it's profoundly important. It's the same with global warming. I mean, ultimately, climate change is an even bigger threat to humanity than than Putin's war. Um, the problem is, if you remain optimistic, you mustn't be so optimistic you don't s- stop trying to change things. Um, and of course, you know, with, say with climate change, as individuals, if we lead a blameless ecological life, it will make no difference <laughs> to whether the climate changes or not. What will make a difference, of course, is political political action. And the same applies to to the war in Ukraine. But at the moment, I see no signs of the British government's support for Ukraine weakening in any way, and nor nor in America. Of course, the terrifying thought is that Trump is still around. He could come back in two years' time. America, it politically, is a very, very disturbed nation. Yes. The fact that so many people still support Trump Tells you there's something seriously, seriously the matter with America as a, as a nation. Um, but at the moment, I mean, I, 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 my understanding is that the West is gradually supplying more and more long range artillery. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens. And when you mentioned that, when you would feel or see that there's reducing the fact of help of the UK government to yeah. Ukraine, you would do more political action. And I wanted to ask you, you have a, do you have a hundred percent support from each of the party in the parliament? And uh, yes, I think so. I do. I think it's unanimous. I'm not, I'm not hearing any voices, political voices saying the government should not be giving lots of weapons to Ukraine. Uh, and of course the British, the British army has been supporting the Ukrainian army for many, many years, ever since Maidan. I remember on some of my flights out to Kiev in the recent past, you know, seeing, well, obviously British soldiers with short haircuts and very tall <laughs> and looking very manly. There were clearly British soldiers going out. So I, that, that will continue. That will continue. Let's fantasize for a bit. When, uh, when the war, war is over and Ukraine yeah. wins in any... Um, in any way, it's constructed. Several countries will, um, what, what's the word? Will appear as the new global re- leaders or the regional leaders. And yes. let's assume it's United Kingdom and Poland and Ukraine because of the role they played in yes. this war. Yes. Um, are you thinking of this future? And when you're thinking of this future, what kind of feelings are you having? What kind of thoughts does it create? Well, the problem in this country is that our the, the government is is not very satisfactory, and Boris Johnson is in deep political trouble. Um, so it's very hard to know what what be happening in British politics. 
over the next few years. It's always been struck me as very ironical that when Britain was a member of the EU, it was Britain which pushed for expansion um, to include Eastern European countries. But because Brexit, as many of us predicted, is proving such an economic disaster, there is now increasing talk about somehow becoming closer to the European Union again. Um, and so it's, I don't know what what will be happening in Europe. I mean, I, I'm a European. I, for me, Brexit was a complete disaster, you know, almost as bad as Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But are you feeling, are you feeling that the UK is becoming more important in a way, and this is a generalization in a way, I understand, but maybe like as the media covering it or as the the the, the power of the voice is, is getting bigger. I've, so I've spoken to Polish political technologists a few times, and they yeah. said, of course, we were feeling that Poland is becoming a bigger player yes. uh, on, on the chess desk. So what about the UK? I, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, these things can change so quickly. But given that clearly Italy and France and Germany are so hesitating, the fact that Britain and Poland are, and, and the Baltics are much stronger in support of Ukraine, I think is, is good. Um, and I'm all for that. But that may change quite quickly. I, I don't know. Well I don't, well, I don't think the Baltics and Poland will lose their... I mean, all the countries that experienced Russian rule in the Soviet era have no illusions about what it's like <laughs> and what Putin might do next. Dr. March, um, with the neurosurgical um, skills and experience that you have in this 100 plus days, um, how have you and the neurosurgical teams of, of British doctors, I'm sorry for saying it this way, have helped Ukraine except well, the seminar that you mentioned? In battlefield injuries, 25% of a death is due to head injuries, but the actual acute surgical management of head injuries in a, in a war zone is very limited. You can't carry out major brain surgery um, on, on a battlefield. So most of military surgery is about blood loss, burns, blast injuries, amputations, things like that. Neurosurgery is really quite quite separate. So other than the my small contribution to David Knott's webinar, I've otherwise just been continuing to talk to colleagues like Andrew Mizak mainly about routine civilian cases. Though I am collecting some and buying some specialist um, neurosurgical equipment, which I hope to get out to Ukraine next month. Understood. Um, is this the money that you're collecting in the UK, the funding that you collect? This is money I've been given over the years, um, by many by my patients, for my, okay. for my work in Ukraine. So I'm quite Understood. keen to spend, spend some of it. Thank you for this. And I'm, there's, a, there's a movie which showed me working in Kiev 12, 12 years ago called The English Surgeon. It's a very good movie. It got an Emmy. Um, it's being shown again at a London film festival in two weeks' time to raise money for Ukraine, and I'll go there and answer questions and talk about it. So I continue to do what, what little I can um, to, to keep public awareness up. And my, my situation is an unusual one, although I don't speak the language. I don't know anybody else who's been going to Ukraine for 30 years. It's quite quite a long time. You, you've been a great friend to Ukraine. And yeah, I have a lot of admiration towards your desire to help Ukraine. And I was wondering whether, while the war isn't going, are you planning on coming to Lviv or other areas to hold a seminar or to meet the, the doctors well, to see how is it? The problem with that is my, my family are adamant that I shouldn't. I think they exaggerate the risk. But at the moment, I, I, I'm going to go to That's Poland it. and I'll meet some, some of my Ukrainian friends who can cross the border will come and meet me and that's how I can give them some medical equipment. But going myself at the moment, I think I can't because my, my family would just be too worried, even though I think it's pretty safe. Understand, and you mentioned in the beginning and in, in the middle of this interview that you don't think this war will end soon. I doubt enough. it. I doubt it. Mm. 
that means that means there's um, at least half a year. That's that's how I feel. What about you? Uh, yes, at least you know, at and then it could, always, it could always become an insurgency. You know, I mean, hmm. it, it's all sorts of things are possible. I, I don't know. I mean, but it's uh, I, don't, I cannot see it ending with hmm. Putin simply having a new boundary of all of Donbass and Luhansk, and that somehow just Now, we had a frozen war before, and it was a small bit, but it's, and now the West is much more openly involved. But of course, the problem is that it is always easier to defend than to attack. And once Russia, if it takes over Don, Don, Donbass and Luhansk, it'll be much more difficult then for Ukraine to counterattack and take it back again. And regain the territories. Exactly. Uh, the nature of, of of my question was whether whether this war is going to take long or longer than just long. Uh, we all have to act in some manner to support Ukraine and to to help yeah. our country. And you would help our country. I would help my country. And um, I was curious, except hope and optimism, what else should we possess as a natural skill or I don't know the leadership? So we are keep our attention on Ukraine. I mean, purely personally, um, I have to, one doesn't want to do too much at once. I would hope to, well, because my new book is coming out in September, there'll be a lot of publicity work about that. The book is partly about Ukraine. They're not about the war because it was written before the war started. So personally, I will use all the media contacts I have to continue to keep Ukraine in the public eye um, and why you know, Ukraine is such an incredibly important part of my life, because it's all about freedom and democracy <laughs> and yes. the values my parents brought me up in. So that at least I'm, I'm lucky to the extent I'm in the position where I can do that because there will be a lot of literary festivals and newspaper articles because I'm a best-selling, best-selling author in England as well as other countries. You have a, a a really large effect on on Britain and in other countries, and you mentioned. And I wanted to ask you whether you've spoken to uh, your Russian friends or Russian counterparts well, or, got, or whoever I've Russians one, since the war started. Yeah, I have one friend in St. Petersburg who sends me the, we exchange the occasional message. And he is is desperate with what's happened, quite desperate. As I'm sure many other Russians, because many young Russians have, have left, of course. So I think it's important. I can quite understand why many Ukrainians, you know, would take the view of any good Russian is a dead Russian, but it's, there's got to be life after the war. And Russia's not all, all bad, you have to, even though the Russian army has been awful. And yes, we know how the Russian army brutalizes its own soldiers, and how most of them are poor conscripts from the Far East, and anybody with money can bribe to get out of being conscripted, and they're treated so badly, and they wonder they behave terribly in, the, in Butcher and Irpin and places like that. That doesn't excuse what they're doing. You know, it, but the problem is that the... The, the utter cynicism of, of, the, of the senior officers and amorality of them all. But there are a few good Russians around somewhere, and some of them are friends of mine. And, and I think, to... yeah, the, the other thing, of course, is London's, London grad and the way it's been this open secret for years that the city of London, the bank, the British banks, were acting as money laundering conduits for the oligarchs. So that at least now there is more public attention to that. But the problem, of course, is the Russian oligarchs have been funding the Conservative Party. You know, they've paid millions of dollars to the, to the ruling political party, and they knew what they were doing. They're not altruists, you know. So that will take a lot of time to un, undo. But if there's a change of government, hopefully that will, that will happen. But not and years. this partially goes into the nature of the question that I had, whether you see that in the last uh, four, almost four months, there is a change in how 
um, British media, British government are dealing with Russians who are in the UK, those who are with money and those who are just regular people. What's the change that you see? Well, I don't know about regular people, but certainly now it's much more widely understood that the, the Russians did their best to corrupt the, the, this country and they influenced Brexit just as they influenced the, the Trump election in America. And I think, that, I think that's more widely understood. Dr. Marsh, if, uh, if this video would be seen by a million of Ukrainians, what would be the message that you want to convey to them? Uh, purely, starting purely personally, I can only say I'm thinking about Ukraine, both the country as a whole and my friends, almost every minute of the day. I wish I wasn't, but, but I am. And I know many, many English people who feel not as personally involved as me, because very few of them have had the prolonged exposure to Ukraine that I've had. But what it says, you, you are not alone, you know, and the fight clearly, and it's well understood in this country, but the fight in Ukraine is about the fight for freedom, not just Ukrainian freedom, but for all freedoms. And it's an immensely important fight. And I wish we could do more to help. Thank you so much, Dr. And never despair. You know, it is, one must not despair because then you stop fighting. You must not have hope and optimism. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. It's my Um, pleasure. Okay. I've been privileged of talking to you. I have goosebumps right now, which is oh, the signal okay. of the body that I am uh, very happy because of this. All right. Well, um, Slava Ukraina. Yeah. Heroim Slava. Heroim Slava.